God is good. And all the time. Beginning this week, uh, we will be uh, starting a three-part vision series uh, that where we're going to be unpacking our ministry values and DNA as a church family. I'll be tag-teaming with Elder Michael, and we'll be hitting the three ministry values for our church family. First is Christ following, then it's Christ proclaiming, and then it's community living. And so I invite us to turn to God's Word this morning. Let's go to God's Word. God's Word this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verse 34. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verse 34. If you're there, I invite us to rise wherever you may be, in body or in spirit, so that we can read together God's holy and sacred word. Let's read this together in one voice. Ready, begin. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Amen. You may be seated. Let's go to God in prayer once again. Jesus, we, we turn to you. We yearn for you. We long for you. Come, Lord Jesus, teach us now. Encourage us now. Challenge us now. For this is your time. This is your will. This is your word. Speak through this unworthy vessel. Let the words coming out of this mouth not be the words of any human being, but be the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. For this we pray in your holy name and all God's people say, Amen. Church, when we uh, try to follow healthy habits, it's hard. When we try to follow our New Year's resolutions, it's day seven, day eight, and some maybe some of us are, are already behind. It's hard. When we try to follow our hobbies, it takes a lot of work. When we try to follow our favorite sports teams, it takes a lot of energy. When we try to follow our intuition, our, our instincts, it doesn't come easy. When it comes to following something, it's not easy. When it comes to following through for something, it's hard. Now, like I shared, the, the next three weeks, we'll be reflecting on our three ministry values as a congregation. And these ministry values serve as our DNA as uh, for our church. It serves as our, pill uh, our ministry pillars for our church and how we do church and who we are as a church. The first ministry value we'll be unpacking is Christ following. And in order to unpack that, uh, we'll be, be diving into the Gospel of Mark here uh, at the end of chapter 8. Now Jesus uh, was in the midst of his ministry where he healed a blind man at Bethsaida. Uh, he fed the 4,000. Uh, Jesus would, was doing incredible kingdom work. So the crowds were flocking to see what was going on and who this miracle guy was. Now, Jesus was addressing both the disciples and the onlookers who were interested and had begun to follow him and see what was going on. Now, Jesus addresses the crowds and the disciples. And this means that this call was to, uh, to follow Christ was sufficient for all, but ultimately efficient for those who were called. You see, the call to follow Christ is daunting. But the call to follow Christ is also a privilege. Our verse that we read here in the Gospel of Mark teaches us to be proactive and, and teaches us these important steps that we need to do in order to follow Christ. And the first step is to deny yourself. Deny yourself. Now, the world often equates denying ourselves as a Christian life needing to be miserable, where we can't have fun, kind of denying ourselves. But that's not really, uh, that's not necessarily the case. 
To deny ourselves doesn't necessarily mean to dehumanize ourselves as human beings or to deny our own our character and our own personality or to even deny materialistic things like the basic necessities of a roof over our head or food on our table. That's not the kind of denying of ourselves that scripture is trying, trying to teach us. Rather, a denying of self is the turning away from the idolatry of self-centeredness and a self-attempt to orient one's life around those self-interests. A.W. Tozer once said, If I am to wholly follow the Lord Jesus Christ, I must forsake everything that is contrary to Him. You see, we as Christians, we need to be reminded of how important it is to crucify the flesh daily. We need to overcome the persistent demands of the flesh and the body. You see, our innate fallen human nature helps emphasize the importance of that self-denial. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24 says that those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You see, self-denial is also another way to decenter our lives from our own and attempt to center our lives on Jesus Christ. It's an opportunity to let go of our selfish desires and lean in to the desires of Christ and the desires that Christ has upon our lives. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 through 5 teaches us that to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Self-denial equates to the willingness to embody Jesus Christ. How do you embody Christ? In selfish, selfless humility. How do you embody Christ? You, it, being able to value the other. Being able to lift up the other. Being able to look and listen to the interests of the other. Self-denial is less of us and more of Christ. The second step to follow Christ is this. Take up your cross. Take up your cross. Taking up the cross was another way to say yes to God's will. Saying yes to God's purpose. Saying yes to God's way. Now when Jesus was first condemned and sentenced, he was tasked with taking up his own cross like any criminal or condemned person does. They take up their own cross to where they will ultimately get crucified or executed. If you think about that walk, it brings a sight of submission for the individual to the authorities. You see, it demonstrates one's public submission and obedience to the authorities with the charges against them. Now, cross-bearing wasn't distinctively Jewish, yet it was still A powerful imagery. Because that submission ultimately led to the death on the cross. You see, when Jesus submitted to God's will, it ultimately led him to death on the cross. Now I'm going to pause there. Because I don't think the author was trying to focus on the literal aspect of the carrying of the cross. You know, scholars have determined the cro- that the cross that Jesus carried most likely weighed around 165 pounds and was around 3 to 4 meters uh, high with the cross beam that was around 2 meters wide. So realistically, this was not a test on whether or not you can bench press at least 165 pounds or not. That's not what it means. Rather... The proper response to this is this. If you say you follow Christ, if you say you follow Jesus, and you're not willing to take up the cross, 
then you weren't willing to be obedient to God's will as a follower of Christ. Taking up the cross, the call to take up the cross is, are you willing to be obedient? Are you willing to be obedient to the point of death? This isn't trying to focus on the suffering aspect on how heavy that cross is or how hard it is to being crucified. This was trying to focus on the obedience aspect that led Jesus all the way to the death for you, for us. And also don't misunderstand this. This isn't trying to say, oh, because you want to follow Christ, you need to just suck it up, buttercup, and just bear life's troubles like you would by bearing the cross. That's not what this means. The focus is, are you ready to embody Christ and be obedient to do exactly what he did, which was take up the cross? Oswald Chambers once said, if I'm going to know who Jesus is, uh, I must obey him. The majority of us don't know Jesus because we have not the remotest intention of obeying him. There are too many Christians in this world that say they accepted Christ, but they don't even know the Christ that they have accepted. There's too many Christians in this world that say that they follow Christ, but they don't even know the kind of Christ that they're following because they're not willing to be obedient to follow the ultimate death. Accepting Christ and then living life on your terms means that you don't even know Christ. You don't even know the Christ that you're talking about if you're living your life on your own terms. That obedience to call, that obedience to call to follow Christ is not only an action, but it's also a sign of our identity in who we are as Christ followers. John Stott put it this way, Our Christian life began not with our decision to follow Christ, but with God's call to us to do so. The third step is this, unashamed. Church, we got to deny ourselves. We got to take up the cross. And we are reminded of that identity that we have in our Christ Jesus so that we can stand unashamed. Mark chapter 8, verse 36. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Jesus is trying to ask you these questions to exemplify the supreme value of eternal life. Let me put it this way. What good does it do when you work Monday through Saturday so hard and your excuse for missing church on Sunday is because that's the only day that you have to run errands and rest up for another week? What good does it do you when you're working overtime just to save up and buy a house while you miss all the opportunities in the world to be a parent or to be a spouse? What good does it do you when you're about the money and comfort and your relationship with Jesus takes a hit? What good does it do when Christ it takes a back seat because you're trying to, f to figure out all the things in your life because church, because following Christ is just another thing to do. You may think I'm being harsh right now, but I am not. I'm just trying to tell you what Jesus is saying here in the gospel of Mark in following Christ. What good is it to focus on the things of the world when all the things of the world will disappear in a split second and it will just disappear and go, be gone and it, will, it, it won't even remain? Mark chapter 8 verse 38, If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when He comes in His Father's glory with the holy angels. This falls in line with what we shared, what I shared from the pulpit last weekend. If you truly follow Jesus, if you truly love the Lord, your Savior as your God, people around you need to be taking notice. People you encounter need to be taking notice. People you encounter need to know who you are in Christ so that they can see who you are by your actions and who you are in your identity, that you are Christ followers. Last year... Uh, 
I met uh, uh, with uh, pastors from our sister reformed churches, uh, Pastor Paul Glover and Pastor Joshua Shad for brunch one day near uh, the Massapequa area. And obviously, we we're talking about faith. We're talking about church. We're talking about the importance of discipleship in the church. And then, the, and then out of nowhere, spontaneously, this couple that was sitting next to us heard, I guess, what we were talking about and said, Hey, we heard you guys talking about church. We heard you guys talking about Jesus. And we just want to share how blessed we are to be able to see people on fire for Christ. We'd love to invite you to our church sometime. First of all, they didn't know we were pastors. Yet, because we were so unashamed of talking about our faith in public, praying in public, people caught notice. People caught wind that we were following Christ. These people next to us were not afraid to strike up a conversation with us because they knew that we are fellow brothers in Christ. Now, obviously, we didn't lie, and we shared with them how uh, we shared with them how we're pastors, and then they were just floored. Wow, what a blessing it is that we get to sit next to ministers of the word. And they shared with us prayer requests, and then they asked us to pray for their family, and then their church. We had a God moment right there. Why? Because we are unashamed in talking about Christ. We are unashamed to share to the world that we are followers of Christ. Fast forward, when we got ready to pay for our bill, the couple who had already left much earlier apparently had already taken care of the bill. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. But that's not the point. The point is this. If you deny all your selfish desires and self-centeredness. If you take up the cross and if you stand unashamed as a follower of Christ, are people taking notice? Obviously, living a Christian life is hard. Following Christ is not easy. But this morning, we have learned here in the Gospel of Mark that when we feel like we're being hindered in following Christ, when we feel like we're having all these obstacles, maybe it's us. Maybe we need to do the refining fire of, of, of cleaning up our obstacles that we might have set in, in front of our eyes, in front of our hearts. Where we need to recenter on Christ, decenter from our self-centeredness, and maybe to, and we need to deny ourself and be reminded that the act of denying ourself isn't withholding us from all these blessings and, and treasures that the Lord gifts us with. The act of denying ourselves is the privilege we have to decenter from our own selfish desires and recenter on Christ. And then to take up the cross. Once again, the focus is not on how heavy that cross is or how hard it is to carry that cross. The focus is on what that cross signifies, which is the ultimate obedience that Jesus yearns for us. Are we ready to be obedient Ultimately surrendering our lives to Christ. My hope and prayer as a church family, as we unpack our ministry values these next few weeks, is that these ministry values do become the DNA of our church, do become the DNA of who we are as followers of Christ. Where our first and foremost identity, value, and goal, and purpose is to follow Christ. Let us pray. Jesus, teach us to follow Christ. Help us to follow Christ. Help us to be obedient to the call in following Christ. In all that we are and all that we do. Lead us, guide us. Come, Lord Jesus. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. So that we can be the Christ-following disciples that you have called us to be. We thank you for the power of the gospel. We thank you for the power of Jesus Christ. And it's in that 
wonderful, glorious, and powerful name that we pray. And all God's people say, Amen.